All right. So welcome, everyone. It's amazing to see such an incredible turnout here today. We have folks from all across the country plugging in. We have folks who were friends and comrades of Ann Braden's. We have people from SCEF. We have people from SNCC. Uh, it's just really wonderful to have so many people gathered here today. And we are going to begin with a grounding meditation. And so I want to invite you to let your breath become soft and slow. And you can close your eyes for this portion if you wish to. And we're gonna ground ourselves in the breath and then also in a sense of collective purpose about what it means to walk in Anne Braden's legacy. And so as you let your breath soften, also breathe in a sense of warmth and of gratitude for everyone who has shown up here today. And let the softness of the breath and the warmth of your spirit allow your energy and your body to soften as well. So as you breathe softly, let the jaw soften, let the shoulders relax. And anywhere where you might be holding tension, allow that tension to begin to melt away. And now I invite you to breathe in the following words. Just allow yourself to feel them. On the one hand, we live in times of ascendant fascism. But on the other hand, we are living in a time when more white people than ever before in US history are asking themselves how they can show up for racial justice. It's an incredible historical moment we're living in, full of both peril and possibility. Breathe in to how much possibility this moment holds. Breathe into the purpose and the power that organizing masses of white people for racial justice holds. Now that work isn't always easy, but we can do it. So to all my white comrades in this room who are organizing white people for racial justice, if we can organize masses of white people for racial justice, we can change how voting happens in this country. That can change and support all of the causes that we hold dear. Breathe in to how much potential that holds. When we organize white people for racial justice, we bring in people with skills and networks, financial resources, which can then be put into the service of supporting black and brown led organizers, and organizations. Imagine for a moment a vast expansion of support. Imagine another 1,000, another 10,000, another 100,000 white people taking leadership from Black and Brown communities and leveraging their resources in the service of those communities. Breathe in to how much potential that holds. If we were to organize enough white people for racial justice, we'd pull the rug right out from under systems of racial inequity that depend on white silence, white ignorance, white inaction, and outright support of white supremacy. Visualize pulling that rug 
right out from under those systems of racial oppression by turning white people powerfully against those systems. Breathe in to how much potential that holds. And now I invite you to open your eyes if, if you had them closed and to look at everyone in this room. Look at everyone in this room and smile at them and say a silent thank you in, the, in your, uh, I'm trying to take myself off spotlight here so you can actually see each other. Give me one second. But take a moment to look at everyone in this room, smile at them and say silently in your heart, thank you. Thank you to each and every person here. Let us all feel deep appreciation for everyone who is a part of this journey. So my name is Lynn Burnett. I'm the organizer of this event and the creator of the White Anti-Racist Ancestry Project which is based on the idea that we can better organize white people for racial justice if they have powerful and inspiring examples to learn from and be inspired by. Providing those examples is part of how we make this large cultural shift that holds so much potential power. Now, Ann Braden, we're all gathered here today on what would have been Ann Braden's 99th birthday. And she is one of the most powerful examples that we have of white people organizing other white people. Her legacy had an enormous impact on today's growing white anti-racist movement, including on showing up for racial justice or surge, which has been at the forefront of that movement. And with that said, I'm honored to introduce the co-founder of Surge, who was mentored by Ann Braden, Carla Wallace. And Carla, can you share with us your own thoughts about why organizing white people is, so, is such a revolutionary task? And how has Ann Braden influenced your thinking around that? Yeah, thank you so much, Lynn. And I am so excited to be here with everybody who's come on. It actually feels quite emotional to me that we're together here on what would have been her 99th birthday and can't say enough about um, the work Lynn is doing in this project and why it matters so much. You know, often as white folks, when we come in, for those of us on the call, we're not all white, but for the white folks on this call, um, you know, we often come in and understandably, it's the horror of, you know, the legacy of whiteness, et cetera. And as Anne used to say, um, you know, guilt is not a very productive way, energy piece to move forward. And so um, it's so critical for us to know that there were white people uh, very imperfectly and far too few of us who made a different choice about what side to be on when it came, came to the deep uh, racist history of this country. And that continues to be critical today. And Ann Braden is one of those, an important one, and also a Southerner. Um, and, um, you know, there were also many unnamed white people who in struggles, especially at the intersection of class and race, like the struggle around Blair Mountain, who go unnamed, but white workers who, um, who you know, went to the jail and at much danger to themselves, freed the black miners who had been locked up for resisting the conditions at the mines. And, you know, and, and I always say that's such a powerful story. And yes, what came next was they were killed together. Um, but those stories are so critical to be part of our root in this work. And so, yeah, it means so much to be here with you all. I met Anne when I was a little girl. And from the beginning, um, I could feel her fiery, passionate caring about um, the possibility of a different world. And, and as a child, uh, you know, born to um, grandparents who were part of the anti-Nazi resistance and my family who was involved in the civil rights movement, 
Um, it was just really powerful and compelling when I met her and her, her husband, Carl Braden. And we went from uh, being where I was mentored by her to um, becoming friends and comrades. And um, her influence on me around the responsibility of those of us who are white to take on the task of organizing uh, other white folks was very deep. Before Surge, I helped co-found the Fairness Campaign, which was around LGBTQ justice. Um, but in that work, we, sit, we brought in a whole bunch of white people and we centered the fight against, um, against racial injustice because we knew we can't win queer rights or really anything in this country without putting race at the center because that's what this country was built on. And Anne, you know, always, she said to us, yes, you are gonna change deeply and personally. She talked about, we have to turn ourselves inside out. But she also always said, yes, personal change, but there has to be systemic change. It, it is not enough for us to go on a personal judge journey to become a better white person, but that we also have to be deeply engaged in the struggles to make the changes around police violence and affordable housing and environmental injustice, all the things that we need, the care for our earth, all the things that it turns out that it is white people overwhelmingly who are blocking all those paths to change. So whatever the issue is that we care about, if we're not addressing race, we are not going to get there. Um, and she says, we had to deal, I want to bring a couple of quotes from her, her own words. We had to deal with the fact that our whole society was wrong, that it had to be totally turned upside down. Racism is not some wart on the body politic, Anne told us. It has to be pulled up by its roots. And so that's going way beyond like personal transformation, it's saying it has to be pulled up by the roots. And she saw that as deeply interconnected, and we do in Surge too, with both undermining the system of white supremacy and understanding that we're not going to end racism under capitalism. And she said, poor white people, like poor black people, are ill-fed, ill-housed, lacking in opportunities for education, medical care, political expression. But what I think we are recognizing is that white people will never solve these problems unless they find a way to unite with the black movement seeking the same things. All of Southern history proves that to be the case. And one of the roots of the work that I do, and, and I wanna say a special love out to the Surge folks. Um, you know, it's not easy work, but it's such critical work. Um, but the call for us, those of us who are white to organize white people, um, it didn't just come when we formed Surge, you know, after the election of the first black president, the tremendous backlash, people of color and others were saying, what are you white people doing to respond to this? It really goes back over 50 years, I think almost 60 now, to the Southern Nonviolent Coordinating Committee putting out a call for white people to organize our own to Malcolm X and the Black Panthers saying, yeah, that's great that you're here with us, but the white people who are really interested in supporting the struggle need to go to where the racism lives in our families, our neighborhoods, our faith spaces. And so Surge has really been a response to that half century ago call for us to do this work um, and why we need to bring in white people. And we have to do that deeply anchored to a black, brown and indigenous vision for the change we need, because that not only is that the change that will liberate us all, but because the directly impacted folks in the history of racism in this country have the clearest view to the path forward. And we have to be deeply connected. Uh, Surge does its work in deep strategic relationship with black, brown, uh, led, led work. Um, and so the other piece about this is so critical and Anne was, you know, early naming it. Um, there's a lot of um, 
which I respect white anti-racist work out there where folks say, you know, and it's a good inclination of the heart. White people say, oh my God, black people are being shot by the police, I want to help. And it's this idea that we as white people are helping someone else. And in Surge, what we do is we ask people to find that deep root of shared or mutual interest. Why are we here? And what is it about our own path, our own experience, our own liberation that will keep us anchored to this fight? And Anne says, I love this quote. I use it all the time. Y'all in Surge have probably heard it. And it's Anne on really shared and mutual interest. She says, in a sense, the battle is and always has been a battle for the hearts and minds of white people in this country. The fight against racism is our issue. It's not something that we're called on to help people of color with. We need to become involved with it as if our lives depended on it because really, in truth, they do. And that, I mean, there couldn't be a better explanation. And for some folks, that is, you know, that, that we know we all need health care and the people at the top are going to keep us from it unless we divide, uh, join together across racial lines. Or it can be because in your family, um, there was violence and violence is the way that the state handles, um, you know, poverty and racism in this country by locking people up in jails and prisons. So whatever it is, when we find our deep uh, a mutual interest, our, our shared interest. It helps anchor us for the work ahead. And then finally, I just want to say, um, you know, we're in this period of rising authoritarianism, um, a, a growing uh, march to fascism, uh, elements of which some communities in this country have felt from the beginning of this country. And we can't take this moment um, uh, lightly, um, the forces of fascism have captured courts, state houses, governorships, our governor is the last Democratic one, not because I think, oh, the Democrats are going to save us. But this is serious. We're battling here in the schools in, in Louisville, Kentucky, where I am, the worst anti-trans legislation in the country. And it's surge that's taking on that fight because we have to contest for the white folks that the other side is assuming will join whiteness instead of the multiracial fight for real democracy. Um, and so I just want to read this from Anne, who again was, you know, seeing ahead. And this is from a great book called Anne Braden Speaks. It's a collection of many of her, uh, her speeches, including a very important letter to white Southern women um, that is in there uh, that you must read. And so she's talking about racism is the path to the police state. She says, if enough white people become convinced that it is black people who are causing their problems, a proposition that powerful forces in this country are trying to convince them of right now, hello, Trump, all the think tanks, the folks you know, trying to pull white people and say the problems are you know, black and immigrant people. It says, then they have a frightening enemy that is right here at home. And under that circumstance, they could buy, literally buy a police state that is your potential mass base for racism in this country. And so what she's saying is racism is the path in. And that's what we see along with these other ways to divide. But it is the go-to with white people to convince them that, or convince us that we have more in common with whiteness and a support for those at the top than we do with uh, Black and Brown and Indigenous people. And um, it's exciting because we're finding that when we actually talk to people at, in the rural, in the small towns, working class white folks understand or are open to the journey to understand that it's the people at the top who are making their families not have, they want, have what they need and not black and people of color. It's not easy work, but if we're not talking to people, then we wonder why folks are pushed in the other direction. So Kate Fossil is Anne's biographer. 
and she is the writer of the very important biography that Lynn mentioned, Subversive Southerner. She's a brilliant historian, a feminist who is deeply influenced by the wonderful work and personhood of Robin D.G. Kelly. She is also the co-founder of the Ann Braden Institute for Social Justice Research at the University of Louisville. And Kate saved Ann's book collections, the ones that were taken, you know, during the attack on her and Carl. And there's an amazing book collection at the Institute. And she's an active part of the struggle for change throughout the South and here in Louisville. I count Kate among the people who I turn to for guidance, and she is a dear, dear friend. And it's my honor to bring on Kate Fossil. Gosh, thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you so much. And you really are a hard act to follow, but I'll try. Um, you know, I, I just have a few things I wanna say. I won't talk for very long, but like Carla, I was mentored by Ann Braden. I uh, did not know her my whole life the way that Carla did, but I came to know Ann very intimately through this odyssey of oral histories, all the many, many interviews I did with her and hours I spent with her really trying to pin her down because Ann was like the energizer bunny when it came to activism. She was 24 seven. She did not want a book written about her. And once she realized it was happening, she would give me a little bit of time here and there. But like some of those interviews were like in the car with a lot of road noise. So you get to know people when you travel with them, when you have your ups and downs. And, um, oh, I, I, well, I, I meant to say, I, I, I am Kate Fossil and I use she, her pronouns. I'm sorry, I, I, but Carla blew me away with her intro, so I forgot to give mine. But um, I guess, you know, Lynn asked me to talk a little bit about what appealed to me about this story. And I have to say that, you know, as a young white woman, because I was a young woman when I got the idea to write this book, um, and I'd never heard of Van Braden. And it troubled me so badly that I had never heard of Van Braden. And then I heard Ann Braden speak at the very first demonstration I ever went to in my life, which was in 1979, dating myself here, um, against the murders of the um, Communist Worker Party activists, the anti-racist activists in Greensboro, North Carolina. And when I heard Anne's voice, I was really something changed in me because I had never known uh, that there were white Southern women who were anti-racists like that. I just, it was powerful. And, and so like one thing led to the other and I became her biographer um, later after that. I mean, it was a dramatic story Anne's story is very dramatic. And if you haven't read it, you can read my book or you can read Anne's own book, which is how I discovered Anne again after I'd heard her. There's Carla showing it. Yes, The Wall Between is a very powerful book that was written in 1958. And it's just as relevant today as it was then, uh, especially with the epilogue that she added to it. Um, you know, so I think, but how is Anne so relevant to us right now? I think that's one of the things that's bringing all of us here. I mean, many of you knew Anne, uh, and I also, I do want to um, shout out to the SNCC activists and SCAF activists that are here in this crowd today, because as Carla mentioned, those folks all knew Anne, they all knew Anne, and they helped resurrect Anne from the pariah status that she held, she and her husband, Carl, even in the movement. So I'm not gonna take up your all's time. We're not really here to talk about history. However, I do want to say that um, what the Bradens went through here in Louisville in the 1950s, when they were indicted for sedition, 
for their challenge to white supremacy. And then the, the, the charges against them were all about communism. They weren't really about racism. It was, it was like covert racism, uh, but they were so demonized here that they had to be reclaimed by a younger generation, which was the SNCC and SCEF youth of the 1960s. And that's sort of what's happening now and over the last you know, 10 or 15 years with the founding of Surge and the rise of fascism among us. I think even when, you know, when Anne, well, Anne was a very early, um, it was, it was very early in calling out re what she called reverse racism since the 1970s. And I think that even in the time Anne died in 2006, you couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine, and I don't even think she could imagine the rise of this very virulent, very open, very brutal and brash form of white supremacy that we saw with the with the advent of our 45th president. Um, and, and so I guess I, I wanna, Carla read some passages from, um, from Anne. I was very proud to have the incredible, uh, Black feminist, anti-racist leader, Angela Davis, write the foreword to my book. And that book is now 21 years old, okay? And so at the moment that um, Angela wrote that foreword, at that moment, we had Bush, uh, George Bush for the president. We were in the aftermath of the September 11th, um, you know, uh, uh, attacks and that was the start of a new the new war on terrorism and so here's what angela had to say um when catherine fossil and ann braden began collaborating on this history of ann's radical activism during the cold war years they could not have predicted how dramatically it would resonate with current political conditions this riveting account of dangerous alliances across racial boundaries can now be read as an incisive reflection on the importance of challenging the Bush administration's aggressive policies in the aftermath of the 2001 attack on the World Trade Center. And we could just, we could just take out the part on about the um, September 11th attacks and put, the, put in the words about the rise of, you know, and this kind of incredible form of forms of white supremacist violence we've seen in Charleston, in Charlottesville, in you know so very very many communities over the last you know five or six years, and so I do think that her story has resonance for people right now in a way that it you know it, it doesn't always have, but at these pivotal moments of upheaval and change and the need for movement building. And as Carla and Lynn have emphasized, the need for more white people. And so I guess I'm gonna just keep it brief because we can talk more in the uh, smaller groups, but you know, there's, there's a very strong parallel to the charges about them being communists and the kinds of charges against even the most, you know, uh, what I might call like milquetoast liberalism today, uh, you know, in terms of the challenge to this rise of fascism. So I think that's an important lesson from Anne's life. And then I think that, um, you know, one thing about Anne's life that appealed to me greatly, and I think that probably the SNCC and SCAF people could join me in that, is the um, the stick to itiveness, the way that she kept on fighting for the right to be part of the movement, even when she and her husband Carl were so demonized during the Cold War as communists. And, and so I think there's a lesson in that for us about um, not throwing people away. 
about not letting ourselves be divided because the person is too, I don't know, too something. I mean, there's a, you fill in the blank with the adjective, but Anne never thought that anybody was beyond the pale. She would talk to anybody about challenging white supremacy. What is white supremacy? What do we, and I'm speaking especially, of course, to the white people need to do. And so I think these are, you know, I obviously have a lot of passion still after all this time about her life. And I'm very, very excited to see a group here come together to reflect on it this way on what would have been her 99th birthday. So happy birthday, Anne. Uh, you're up there watching over us. And the last thing I want to close with is, um, is to just say that in Anne's language, in Anne Braden's language, that we, what we are doing in convening here today, what you all are doing, many of you work with Surge and other organizations around the country, we are part of the other, what she called the other America. There is another America. And it's very hard to be, you know, aligned with even the words United States these days. But there's another America. And by, you know, being active against racism, we are part of that other America and we are carrying on the torch. So thank you so much. And I'll uh, turn it back to you, Lynn. Thank you. I am now unmuted. I was saying thank you so much, Kate. And once again, it's a real honor to have you with us and to have Carla Wallace with us. I so deeply appreciate uh, both of you. And for most of the next hour, we're going to turn over to the participants now. And folks are going to be in small breakout groups and a mix of small breakout groups and whole group discussions about what we have to learn from Ann Braden. And so I want to uh, kind of introduce what we're going to be doing in the breakout groups uh, real quick. So there's going to be one breakout group where we're, we're going to focus first on Ann Braden's growing process and what does the white anti-racist growing process look like. And actually the first thing that I want to do right now, because we have about 100 people in the room, I want to ask people to pause uh, comments in the chat for just a second. Uh, I'm going to drop a link in the chat right now for a summary of Ann Braden's growing process, and I'll say why in just one second here. So I just dropped that link in the chat, and I want to ask everyone to go ahead and open that link up uh, right now. So what we're going to be doing in the first breakout group is, well, first we're going to be in the breakout group for 15 minutes. We're going to be in groups of three or four and spend the first five minutes in that breakout group reading over that summary of Ann Braden's growing process and then spend the other 10 minutes reflecting on the prompts that are in that reading. And then we're going to come back to the whole group and we're all going to be in conversation about what stood out to us about that growing uh, process. So does anyone have any questions? before we move into the first breakout group. All right, I will go ahead and uh, put us into those breakout groups then. Actually, a lot of people are leaving with the breakout groups. That's unfortunate. So I'm gonna do a recalculation so that we don't have, um... okay, it was gonna be 27 groups. Let me just recalculate this. Um, okay, we're currently at 75. Okay, we're going to have 19 groups. So I'll see you all back here in 15 minutes. I'm going. You're muted. I'm so sorry. I've been talking all kinds of things. Um, so we heard I'm, everything until the recording started. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's confusing. Well, welcome back. Um, 
you know, when we're organizing white folks for racial justice, it really helps to understand what calls people in, what helps people to grow, what supports people in moving to that next stage of development, what supports us in moving to our next stage of, of development. And so we're going to begin uh, in, in this whole group conversation, which we're going to be in for about 15 minutes. We're going to start by just laying out some of the things that supported Ann Braden's growth. And so I want to ask if there is someone here who can maybe lay out three or four things that helped Ann Braden to grow uh, as a child and as a young woman in college. And then we'll do, after we kind of get through that, then we'll think about her as a journalist and how she began her organizing. But can someone think of three or four ways, things that helped her to grow as a child and through her college years? And please feel free uh, either to use the raise hand emoji, which you could find at the bottom of the screen, or go ahead and just feel free to speak your, your voice. Yeah, Cindy, thanks for helping us get the ball rolling. Well, um, so I didn't say this, but somebody else in my breakout room said uh, what, what uh, really resonated for me, curiosity, willingness to engage, um, willingness to find out more about people that she didn't have anything in common with and being a lifelong learner. And again, that was not me who came up with that, but um, it made a lot of sense to me, so. And I think for Anne specifically, when um, she met Harriet Fitzgerald and then Harriet Fitzgerald had her at that dinner, um, with the first black person she'd ever been with and she was like oh this is just a human <laughs> there's no reason we should be separate um so i think that was huge as far as helping her to grow thank you abby and betsy it didn't come in this this little excerpt we just read but in the previous reading i was really struck with her uh christianity because that's not a source I ordinarily look to, but clearly she um, really was holding Christianity to account for to be what it really says it is. And um, that, that she felt like, and I was surprised at how strong, how her Christian beliefs really supported her throughout her life with all the different adversities she faced. So that's not a, a source that I would have been looking for and um so I, I was very impressed with that thank you betsy and also good to see someone from the black movement thought group in the house uh, to talk about Anne braden with us and Diggs, thank you for uh for adding more um one other thing i think that her uh having a community and like mentors and people that she could come out of like the isolation and in, and in, in, uh, commune with and conversate with and learn from. Mm -hmm. um, that seemed pretty formative for her as, as well as other people in our group. Yeah, thank you so much. That's so important. Uh, and, and Vern, what are your thoughts? Sorry, I'm not that great with the technology either. I should be, I'm a teacher, but you know, um, I live in Evanston, Wyoming, and I can really identify with, in a little bit different way, she was around Black people when she was younger, but I am not even around any Black people. I have one Black friend, and I think there are maybe 15 Black people in, in Evanston, Wyoming, where I live, in a town of 10,000. And so my opportunities to interact with black people are very limited. I would really like to be able to find black friends that I could actually connect with. I thank you for sharing, Vern. And we're gonna go Alexandra Monk and then Larry Rubin. What are your thoughts? Oh, sorry, I had to unmute myself. The other 
um, thing that struck me was when um, she had started to meet and understand other black people and have them speak their piece to her. And then she realized how inauthentic all of her interactions had been up until that point, um, especially as a child when black people didn't have, um, when there was a power dynamic and she was on the top and um, she hadn't realized that people were not, were not just being timid or content. Um, they didn't have the power to say anything and not have repercussions. And then for her to stand in that in, in those people's shoes and see that how they must have felt. Uh, I think that was a really powerful experience. Yeah, thank you so much for lifting that experience up, Alexandra. And we're gonna go Larry and then Deanna. Um, when I was working with Ann and Carl as a, as a SCEF organizer, mm -hmm. um, they were beyond the point that we're talking about now. Uh, be, beyond the idea uh, of uh, learning that uh, you know black people were people too and so forth what they were saying then to white people is you know uh, we don't care who you like or love the fact is if you're going to get uh, a secure future if you're going to get enough money to live on you got to work with other people uh, a period uh, and within that context, you know, get to get to know other types of people, but not for the just the sake of of getting to know other types of people. I think the Anne's trajectory that we read is very typical of leaders uh, of the community. A lot of people have that um, that kind of trajectory, uh, you know, based on curiosity, on um, the intellectual understanding that things are not just uh, and so forth. Uh, but the people that we are interested in organizing, really that's not the kind of trajectory we can expect them to go through. It has to be based on their own self-interest. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what Ann and Carl preached. Yeah, thank you so much, Larry. And good to see you here, by the way. Um, and by the way, our next breakout group, we're really going to be looking at Anne's organizing, and then we'll have another whole group discussion about the organizing. Um, and shared interest, mutual interest is, is huge. Uh, Deanna, I know you've had your hand up for a while. What are your thoughts about the growing process? Thank you. Um, I mentioned this in my breakout room, but I, and so I'll be much more brief, um, but I wanted to say that uh, I identified with her willingness to an apparently consistent um, exercise of leaning into the discomfort and uh, bumbling, you know, finding herself making mistakes and going back and going back anyway. That takes a lot of humility. Uh, and, you know, like you said, curiosity, but also bravery and dedication and uh, willingness to be vulnerable because <laughs> I'm, I mean, I've been around for a long time, but 2019 changed me and I went out there and made a lot of mistakes. And I love that she said that she talks about the mistakes that she made and um, that's inspiring. So thank you. Yeah, you know, thank you for, thank you for sharing. And I got to lift up something real quick because someone put in the chat, Sonny Smith, said in the chat that being at a women's college allowed her to shine intellectually. And I just wanna lift that up as being really important. She was able to escape her bubble. She was able to go to a college and she was able to go to a college specifically that really supported her identity as a, as a woman and allowed her to expand her concepts, you know, what she could do with her life, you know, specifically as a woman. So being in that community was so important. So thank you, Sunny, for lifting that up. And we're going to go Nora and then Abby. Okay, there. I'm unmuted. Hi, thank you. Um, well, close related to that and her time in college was uh, one of the things that really struck out to me was that um, 
it was in a community of people who were creative and artists and journalists and you know that that kind of space to imagine a different way of being um carla mentioned that in her in her introduction and so did you lynn um that 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 openness to another way of thinking and another way of imagining um i think can't be understated either um, although, of course, then, as it says in the thing, then she needed to actually do something about that, not stay just in that creative head. But. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Nora. And Carla Wallace in the chat says, having the space to imagine another world. Abby Young, and then Jacob, and then after that, we're going to pivot to a slightly different question. I just wanted to um, add on to that, saying that was a really aside from just having incredible personal integrity in her early years, uh, being able to visualize that out of isolation was tremendously important. And as we talked in our breakout group, I think isolation is something we really have to work on as white people. Um, going to college for me was the same uh, situation in the 60s. My God, what's happening in the South? I had no idea. I never learned this. This is not happening. This is not real. And so um, having community to understand what else is happening and get into another under, uh, world, as, as Carla said, is tremendous and to have mentors with that. So I just support our staying in community, this one and continuing because that's the way we make it through. Thank you so much, Abby. And Jacob, what are your thoughts? Just a really basic one, um, and that she grew up in in a community, um, and it was happened to be a, a white community. Um, but we all grow up in in some form of community, and it's not going to represent the full diversity of the world. And it's not possible. Um, and so, for all of us, for every child that's ever born, there's going to be a journey. Um, and I, you know, I'm raising my kids in a fairly diverse community for me. Right, um, but it represents the diversity that's available in Kansas City, right? Um, so there's there's going to be a growing process for everyone. So in just one second, uh, I want to ask people to reflect on what your own growing edges might be, and might and what might support uh, your own growth. But before we ask that question, I'm just going to kind of reflect back to everyone what has been shared already someone mentioned christianity she had a spiritual path you know that really helped to to guide her uh which was important to Anne for the, for her entire life um she was able to step outside of her bubble she was able to break away from a segregation sub bringing a big part of that was been able to have a new experience outside of that an artistic circle where people were breaking norms a mentor in the form of harriet fitzgerald who was able to organize a meeting with a black woman so that Anne was able to break that segregationist barrier to feel what that was like. Um, and then also some things that haven't been mentioned I wanna lift up, directly witnessing racial oppression as mm -hmm. a journalist, seeing that with her own eyes, you know, mm -hmm. that was a really important thing mm -hmm. for her. And, you know, for, for, for me that moment, you know, there were many moments bef before this of a lesser degree, but for me, it was teaching incarcerated kids, personally, you know, getting closer to oppression, getting closer to witnessing has been important for a lot of us. Um, and then many of you have just mentioned how important it was not to be isolated. And of course, she joins this union. She meets her husband, Carl Braden. And along the way, she has lots of support, lots of feedback, lots of opportunities to mess up, but also to have people hold her and give her the opportunity to learn from some of the mistakes that she was making. Um, I want to take a moment, we're going to go into another breakout group soon, but let's all take a moment to just reflect for a second on what our own growing edge might be and what might support us in taking the next step forward on our own path. So I just want to invite us to all hold space for a second. Take a couple of breaths if you want to. Just allow yourself to feel into what that might be. And because we have so many people here, we still have over 70 people. I want to invite folks to put that in the chat, you know, what that growing edge might be. 
and what might support you in that. And let's see, let's see collectively that way, kind of what is alive for folks in their group. So if everyone could take a moment to reflect and put that in, in the chat. And we're just gonna hold space for people to reflect and be quiet for a minute while folks do that. Hmm. So someone writes, overcoming isolation is my big challenge. Surge is a great help. Overcoming and letting go of my anxiety of doing it wrong, someone writes, that's their growing edge. Someone writes, something that would support them is a community that is committed to doing the work. Someone mentions the importance of mentorship that they feel like they could use a mentor. And some of us can be mentors and some of us need mentorship. And, you know, I think probably most of us need both. Someone says seeking out personal interactions with, you know, people of other races and ethnicities. Um, thank you, everyone. There's a lot of different responses rolling in now. And I just want to urge everyone to take a look at those. All right, so thank you everyone for sharing. I know there's lots more that we could share there, uh, but I want to now turn to Ann Braden as an organizer and to take some time today to reflect on, on her organizing. And so what we are going to do, we're going to get into another small breakout group. We're going to be in that breakout group for 15 minutes and it's going to be the same process. We're going to spend five minutes looking over a summary of Ann Braden as an organizer and understanding, I, I do wanna emphasize that a lot of what's in the summary is her organizing during the civil rights era. And we should all be aware that she organized for 50 years you know, beyond that era. And so you know, this is a summary, there's so much more that could be said. So once again, you know, turn to Kate Fossil's book, Subversive Southerner to explore that. Um, but does anyone have any questions before we get into that breakout group? So I've just dropped the link for that summary in the chat. I wanna ask everyone to open that up to make sure you have it open in your browser before you go in there. And I'll see you back here in 15 minutes unless anyone has any questions beforehand. Like that. Welcome back everyone. Uh, I think that we are all back here now and we are going to do something similar to what we did last time, which is to share out the ways that Ann Braden, the, the strategies that she used to organize white people for racial justice. And let's just kind of lay out all of those strategies. And then we're going to reflect on which of those strategies feel really relevant to your life if you are someone who is involved with organizing white people for racial justice. So first, let's start with uh, just laying out those strategies. What's what stands out to you? And Abby, thank you for helping to get us started with that. No problem. Um, I was telling my group one of the most impactful things that I think that she did is made people, um, specifically anti-racist white people, not, not feel alone through her journalism and and organizing. Because I was saying I'm a tiny little blue dot in a sea of red and sometimes you feel alone when all you hear is the alternate thought process and so especially considering the time when she was doing it is insane to me because nowadays it's easy you send a facebook post or a tweet or well whatever they're called now <laughs> you know any of those things and it's a lot easier than it was but in the 50s and the 40s to you know write articles and like knock on people's doors and like hey i heard you're not racist <laughs> basically um just to gather like-minded people and mm -hmm. me personally it resonated a lot for making sure people knew they weren't alone because i feel like that's the easiest way for people to to get lost and like lose themselves yeah, thank you so much for lifting that up and for and for giving a couple examples of how she helped people 
to not feel alone and isolated. And I actually want to, I know that Frederick has uh, their hand up, but I want to stick with that theme around helping people who are feeling isolated, not feel so isolated. Can we stick with that theme for a second? What else did she do to support, uh, to support white people who were feeling isolated and not feeling that? And Frederick, if you were gonna to speak to that, I wanna invite you to speak to that. I think um, one of the things that struck me as a community organizer was her willingness to like go out and do the work of, you know, introducing herself, like being the catalyst to bring people into the movement. Um, it's such a, like, it's, such a commitment to go into a community and say like hey who are the people that might be you know open to this and to be the one to put yourself out there um and not to take us off topic but i would love your thoughts if we have the time for it lynn our group was wondering like where Anne got her support in her personal life both like financially and like um you know, like who cooked dinner for Anne when she was out like knocking on doors and like, how did she practice self-care to be able to maintain the work that she did so that she could continue to bring more people in? Um, so obviously not for right now, but wanted to throw those questions out there too. Yeah, uh, if, if Kate Fossil is still in, in the house, I know it's late on the other side of the country, but I want to invite her to uh, respond to that quickly. And the, the, I'll share that one of the things that comes up for me there's an image that I love of Ann Braden and Ella Baker, another <laughs> relentless grassroots organizer, master grassroots organizer. Study Ella Baker if you haven't already. Um, but I love this image of her and Ella Baker going out to a cabin in the woods, sipping whiskey together, and <laughs> just talking about their families and kind of talking about their emotional lives and taking a moment to step outside of organizing, organizing, organizing. So, um, you know, she had, she had friends and comrades. And of course, Carl Braden, uh, incredible, uh, you know, partner to Anne, you know, they were really in the movement together. And that was, that was an important way of her keeping her emotional life together as well, from what I know. Well, Lynn, thank you. I think that you have really covered it. Like, you know, and, and people like Ella Baker were actually better at Anne than taking the time to sort of work through all that, you know, Anne was always on the go. And yet she did have a core group of comrades uh, and most strikingly among them was Carl. And that it was that kind of deep movement rooted friendships that led her to talk so much about the power of this other America. Because when she would travel, I mean, someone talked about like what sustained her, who sustained her, there were little pockets of people in Boston, in New York, in Detroit, in San Francisco, in LA, in Atlanta, uh, and, and those networks, and she had a bigger network still here in Louisville, marginal as it was in a way. And so those people formed the um, basis for her uh, powerful holding on to that idea of the other America. So thanks for calling on me. I, I was just writing a message in the chat. I do have to get off. I did not get a chance to have dinner before this, but this has been an amazing conversation and I really enjoyed it. And it's so wonderful to see faces like Zahara and just people that I like know of or revere or have met briefly or saw at a conference. And it's inspiring to see how many of you are out there doing this work. So thank you for having me so much. And if anybody wants to reach me, I just retired from the University of Louisville, but you can still reach me on that email. And so don't hesitate to, to you know, write to me if I can be of service to any of you. And Lynn, thanks again. If you can stay with us for just one second, Kate, I want to <laughs> okay. invite everyone to throw some heart emojis up on the screen. Aww. Show your love to Kate Fossil, <laughs> my subversive Southerner. Thank you. Book. And Kate, thank you. Thank you for being with us tonight. And thank y'all. Bye-bye. All right. We're going to continue this conversation of 
who was Anne Braden as an organizer? What are some other things that she did to organize white folks? And we're gonna go Crystal and then Nancy. So I think it, um, I think that reading said that she brought people together in these regional meetings. Mm -hmm. And that was actually even a way for her to support the black and brown communities um, where she was. So yeah. What an amazing organizer she was, eh? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say something real quick about those regional gatherings, building off the theme of, of isolation, which is you know very much still something that we have to work with today. Um, you know, she pen paled people. She identified people of like mind and she really actively put them in touch with each other so they could call each other, write each other letters. But then she knew that it was really important to meet face to face and to have that more human connection too. So she hosted those regional gatherings as well, which I think is so important for all of us to have moments where we can all get together and really commune together um, and, and get to know each other. And of course, those were also ways that white folks from across a certain region could also meet with key black or organizers from a certain region and get to know one another too. So that was hugely important. Um, and Nancy, I know that you were next there. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Um, I was going to say the regional gatherings and also just compiling mailing lists, which you know back then was, again, harder than it maybe is now, compiling and keeping them up. Um, and I love the pen pal idea. I don't think I had heard that before because that, especially in times that are dangerous for people to get together, that's a really good way to keep connections. So I'm going to think about ways of doing that here. Nancy, it's good to see you, by the way. Thank what you, Lynn. It's a pleasure. What are some other things that Anne Braden did to help organize white people for racial justice that we have not named yet? I'm not sure if anyone said it. Um, am I, is there, was I supposed to raise my hand? I'm sorry. Oh, no, know. it's fine, CJ. Okay, I wasn't sure if anybody said it, but she also became the liaison between the white community and the black community by being on the editorial bo um, board of a black um, of a black newspaper. It's important that white people don't try and overtake a black organization, but by seeing what the priorities are and the discussion, she can then lead white people to. Um, to work in harmony or conjunction of those priorities, so. Yeah, thank you, CJ. Uh, Don Manning Miller, I say that someone asked a question about a database. I'm kind of wondering, it'd be nice to hear from an old SCEF person. Could you, could you say a little bit about that? About the database? <laughs> someone was curious. I just, no, I just, Sarah, I just made a note. Uh, Tongue in cheek note uh, with the true statement that the database was on three by five cards, you know, in a big long uh, box. Uh, so it wasn't quite as convenient and easy to use as uh, our computer list today. And uh, there, there, there was more than one. One was the activist list, and then another was the the uh, supporters no. list, the, the list of supporters in the north. And you know, we would uh, all do our turns going north and talking to white liberals and radicals and leftists and talking about what was going on in the south and trying to get money from them and so on. So I, may, I remember I spent many a night in New York City in somebody's living room going through those three by car, five cards and calling folks out in Connecticut and setting up meetings and <laughs> you know, going to beg for money. Yeah. Don, thank you for that. It's great to see you here. What are some other things that Ann Braden did to organize white folks for racial justice? And then in a second, we're going to start to think about are any of those things that we could do or that we could learn from or we could maybe adjust a little bit uh, in our own efforts to organize white folks? Well, you know, one of the things that I thought, I mean, uh, the things that have been listed are all really important things. And, and Ann Braden was a master at doing those things. But, and I knew Ann. And uh, I, she didn't mentor me. I knew Ella Baker. She did not mentor me. People who had been mentored by them were people, I guess, mentored me. I was around them and they told me I was a fool for doing this and showed me how to do that and all the rest of it. And, 
Don, somebody I've known since back then, and, and I went through those cards too. I remember Walter Collins, who was the executive director when the, at the toward the end of SCIF, uh, said he didn't think it ought to be put on computers. It's just too easy to steal. Mm -hmm. And the, it, it was harder to, to, to steal those three by five cards mm -hmm. for the government to seize them and so forth. So, uh, you know, it may, it may be easy, but it's all, also easy for somebody to, to snatch that. One of the things that came up in the group I was in, the small group I was in the last time, I think all these things we've been mentioning, you know, networking and, and supportive and all that of each other. But one of the things that I think is really important, and I do not know what Ann Braden did with respect to this, and that is what did she say to somebody? You know, how did she approach an individual white person who, who may even be a Klan member, right? And that has happened. I mean, I know people who did that and, and, uh, and were able to turn uh, Klan members into allies. Um, and so I think that's the thing that I don't know. I don't know what, and from my experience, I don't think there's any particular magic way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the only recommendation I, I made was, I think when you start out with somebody, it's important to do one-on-one -on -one conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you, there, there's a lot of traps that can that you can avoid if you do that. That doesn't mean you never get together as a group, uh, but but I think when your initial conversations, it's really important uh, to have it one on one. You can dive a lot deeper. You don't have all the noise that can take place if you've got several people. You know, um, you know some of it malicious noise and some of it just inadvertent noise. But that, that's my experience. I don't know what Ann Braden said. And, I, and frankly, I don't think there's a thing that you say exactly. Yeah. That, is, that is really a, a great question, John. And by the way, I'd love to be in, in, in touch uh, later after this gathering too. Um, one of the things that, that, just to build off of that before <laughs> Mary, I'm gonna call on you in just a second, but I think of how Ann Braden was able to build her strong connections with black freedom struggle communities partly in her capacity as a journalist and lifting up their voices and thereby building a relationship that way and asking them who were the sympathetic white folks who they knew in their region. You know, I know she was knocking on a lot of doors and calling a lot of white folks who were already sympathetic um, and kind of beginning, beginning with that, identifying the folks who were ready to move or potentially might be ready to move and kind of starting with those folks. But I'd be really curious if anyone does know what those conversations look like. Please get in touch with me. Maybe there's a way to lift, lift up those examples. Well, remember, um, remember what SNCC asked, what SNCC told the white people who were in SNCC, I wasn't in SNCC, but I, I was around people who, who had been in SNCC. And this was reflected in, in the, uh, on the, uh, in the Southern Patriot and in the in SCIP. We, we were asked by the black community to go into our communities and organize uh, you know, organize people in our community to be uh, in support of, I'm not quoting this, but in support of basically the black liberation struggle. And, um, and that was, that was the, that, that was the, that was the ask. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, you know, that's, uh, you know, I, and I've been working on that. I know Don and other people have been working on that for a long time. And I, you know, it's, it's, it's still a pretty big ask. It's, it's a still a pretty big ask. Yeah. Um, we are coming up on uh, close to the end of this conversation. So we're going to start to wrap up this whole group conversation in just four uh, minutes here. So I really want to hear uh, from Larry and then from Abby. Um, and if anyone has a quick comment about how they might apply some of this, these organizing lessons to something that they might be doing themselves. That especially would be really great to hear before we wrap up this whole, whole group conversation here. Um, and then Zahara, we've got to hear from Zahara. Um, okay, I'm, <laughs> okay, and then uh, M, M. Carlis. All right, so we've got, we've got uh, four uh, comments and then we're gonna move into a transition towards the end after these uh, four comments. And we're gonna go Larry, Abby, Zahara, and M. It answers to the question of organizing blacks and whites together. How did they end, what did Ann do? Um, here in Holly Springs, uh, she helped us organize in 1964, a labor union among black and white workers at a brick making factory. 
Mm -hmm. And um, they voted together for the union. Mm -hmm. For all we know, all the whites were members of the Klan, but they needed a raise. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ann stepped in and helped us do that. Thank you so much, Larry. Abby, what are your thoughts? My, my quick question for Ann and also for all of us going forward is, in, in spite of her incredible courage, how did she deal with her fear? Does anyone know how she used, dealt with her own fear and still went forward? I would love, I would love if, so, if someone does know here, that would be amazing. How she what? Well, I didn't hear the how question. How she dealt with her own fear. I am going up against something that could kill me and I'm going to still do it. How did she keep doing that? Well, I think we learned today, even though I wasn't here all day, that she did go to an African-American college, right? No, she, 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 she went to a women's college. Um, um, she ended up going to a, I'm going to have to look that up, but from what I understood, she went to an African-American college where two men were killed on campus. And she saw that and she said that after she had finished um, seeing that, she had no more fear. So I, I may have the wrong person, but I believe that was Anne Braden. You know, I would... Uh... I would say a, a big thing for Anne and for most people when it comes to fear is having having community, have people that love and support you. Um, you know, and she and she definitely you know had that. And because we're running low on time, I want to move on to another comment. Um, Zahara and then Marilyn. Thank you. And it's wonderful to be here. And thank you so much, Lynn, for organizing this. Uh, I knew Ann Braden, and uh, I just wanted to follow up with what John said. John Ratcliffe uh, was that uh, in SNCC, when uh, you know a group of us uh, suggested that the white uh, comrades should go into the white community. Mm -hmm. to organize in 1966, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was quite a bit of pushback and not to mention that, you know, Stokely had said black power. And so that all got hooked up and we were, some of us were being called reverse racist and all of that. But when I look back now, and of course we had a number of white comrades who did go and form what we were calling the white folks project. And they did go into communities and they were treated even worse than we had been treated as an integrated group. Uh, and in some cases run out of those communities into which they had gone. So this is something, you know, that some of us have understood has to be done since 1966. Because if we're going to turn this thing around, it has got to be uh, whites and blacks and Latinos and Asians, all of us together. So I'm uh, really appreciative of Surge and the work that you all are doing. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Zahara. It's wonderful to see you here. And I just dropped a link in the chat. There's a new book by Dan Berger about Zahara and Michael Simmons, State on Freedom, deeply inspiring book. Urge you all to, to pick it up. Um, and you know, there. I just need to reiterate: there's this long-standing call coming from the Black freedom struggle for white people to go into white communities and mobilize white folks. And and if white folks could do that work on a massive scale, we really change things. And to go back to the vision that I was trying to meditate on earlier when we started, that pulls the rug right out from under systems of racial inequity. If we can do that, I think we can. We're going to close uh, this conversation uh, with one more comment from Marilyn, and then we're going to do a closing kind of a, uh, um, you know, activity together. So Marilyn. Yeah, I want to thank Zahara for her activism, apparently in SNCC. But I wanted to say that one thing that has helped me is that one of our organizers who's more involved, even is more involved in, SNCC, in SURGE than I am, uh, always 
reaches out and says and and asks, did you remember we have a meeting tomorrow or thanks for or I'm sorry you had to miss even when I'm out of town, you know, on the computer, he will reach out to me and, you know, it's the personal, as we've said, community, but it's the personal connections that are important. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Um, before we close out, you know, deep gratitude to, to all of you for, for being here today. Um, but before we close, I want to take a moment before we move into our closing. I want to take a moment to build support for the White Anti-Racist Ancestry Project. And I've just dropped a link to the GoFundMe for that in the chat. Um, so we are all here together because of this project. And a big goal of that project is to create more opportunities like this one to help folks who are already committed to organizing white folks for racial justice to deepen our capacity to do that. Now, all of the resources created at this project are freely available to every single white anti-racist organization you know, in the country um, and to everyone all over. You know, and, and that by itself, the fact that it has already been seen and shared about 200,000 times on social media, for example, it's really getting out there in the world. It's having a broad impact. But this is a resource that helps you know, committed white anti-racists to deepen their capacities that's just a part of what the White Anti-Racist Ancestry Project is all about. It's also really about helping to bring about a larger cultural shift in white America. And I wanna share a quick story about what I mean by that. And as I tell this story, I wanna urge everyone to head over to the GoFundMe uh, right now as I'm telling this story. And I just dropped the link in the chat for that again. And our goal, is to have this project uh, funded through the summertime, which can happen by the time this story ends in just two minutes. If folks in this room give an average of $40, and I know that some folks can only you know, give five or 10, and some people might be able to give 100 or 200, but I ask you guys to, to stretch, uh, to give to this project, and we'll return here in two minutes, uh, but I hope folks are going over there uh, right now to make those donations as I tell this story about why this project is really important. So three months after founding this project two and a half years ago, a middle school teacher reached out to me. And I want to ask folks to stop posting stuff in the chat right now. I want to make sure folks can find uh, that, that GoFundMe there. Thank you. Um, so a middle school teacher reached out to me and she had a group of students who had formed a white anti-racist affinity group. And she thought that my project could be of support to her students. And so I sent those students five short stories that I had written. They were each one page each, about five different figures. And then I got together with these students and they shared out you know, what they had found powerful, inspiring and compelling about those stories. And it was incredible to see each of these young people, 12, 13, 14 years old, gravitate towards the figures that most, um, that, that, mo that made them think of themselves. So for example, the student who was a musician really gravitated towards Zofia Horton, who was a powerful movement artist, movement musician associated with Highlander. The student who loved photography gravitated towards Bob Fitch, a movement photographer. And the student, you know, who wanted to get into the medical field gravitated towards Quentin Young, a movement doctor. Two of the queer students who were in the group really gravitated towards Lillian Smith. And what's so powerful about seeing this and, and witnessing this was that a lot of you know, these white students had been really unsure about what their role in racial justice might be as white people and seeing these figures who they could really identify with helped them, you know, was it was something that gave them hope and something that gave them inspiration. And it really quickly helped them see new ways that they could put their passions and their skills into the service of racial justice. Now, since that time, I've offered over 40 workshops on white anti-racist history. And in many of those workshops, parents who are raising white kids say that they've been looking for the kind of resources that I'm 
developing at the White Anti-Racist Ancestry Project. And so this project is about helping committed white anti-racists cultivate themselves, but it's also about creating resources that can help us raise a white anti-racist generation. And it's about creating resources that help us, that can help us call average white Americans into this work. And if we can do that, if we can call enough white folks into this work by providing them with opportunities to see their role in this work, that's part of how we pull the rug right out from under systems of racial inequity, as I mentioned just a little while ago. So once again, uh, I hope that folks have been over there at the GoFundMe as I told the story, uh, contributing. It would be wonderful to get this project funded, uh, excuse me, through the summertime. Um, and we can check in on where we're at with those donations in just a minute. But for now, I wanna call people back uh, to the room to close out uh, in a kind of closing grounding together. And if you are someone who knew Anne Braden personally, I also want to invite you to stay uh, beyond the closing so that folks who knew Anne can also have some time to be in community together. Sure. And so I want to invite folks to feel into what is feeling most alive for you from our two hours together today. And breathe into that. Let yourself feel into what is alive for you. What are you taking from this workshop? Breathe into what is feeling alive. And then let's take a moment to hear from just five people about what it is that you're taking from this workshop today. And if you want to put that in the chat, that would be wonderful as well. But it'd be great to hear from five people what it is that they're taking from this time together today. I'm taking uh, intergenerational learning. Mm, thank you, Greg. Someone says hope. Someone says courage and community. What else are you taking with you today? Yeah, I would love to just say that I'm very inspired and encouraged and feel like there's like an ebb and flow in this work and there are moments of backlash and retrenchment and can easily get discouraged. And it's it's community and storytelling and examples of bravery like Anne's and like so many people here um, that really nourish me um, and keep me encouraged for the long haul. So, um, and I'll just say I have an iron in the fire around a white anti-racist youth summit project here locally in DC and would love to connect with folks because it's needed. We need to create belonging for young white people in this work. So um, anyway, much love everyone. I want to take a moment to really, you know, really encourage people. Uh, if you're interested in, in organizing white youth, definitely reach out to Jason. And once again, you know, that's part of the long haul work is, is making sure that we're raising that white anti-racist generation. And we really, really need all the, you know, anything we could do to do that, we need to be doing that. So please reach out, reach out to Jason. And once again, um, you know, hope that the work that I'm doing inspires you to support you know that that as well. Um, a lot of great comments coming in in the chat. The importance of relationships, the importance of mentorship, the sense of continuity over time, the importance of having the sense of having some kind of lineage, um, having an expanded sense of possibility. And Jason also just put his email in the chat if you want to reach out to him, if you're interested once again in, in organizing white youth for racial justice. All right, everyone, it has been a true uh, blessing to be with you all tonight. Um, oh, I see Zahara, you just had your hand up. So yes, please. And you're muted. Just very quickly, I, I have, I've never been more encouraged than I was 
seeing all of the white young people who marched uh, in the Black Lives Matter movements across the country, you know, uh, they said these, these demonstrations were the largest we have ever had in this country. And in many instances, you know, in these towns, it was like almost all white people marching with Black Lives Matter sign, signs. And it was just so encouraging. But at the same time, I believe that this is one of the reasons we have had this tremendous pushback mm -hmm. uh, because there is fear of young white people giving up on the white supremacist project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zahara. And once again, to harken back to the opening meditation, we live in historically important times, and that's true for many, 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 many reasons. But one of them is that there is a greater possibility right now than ever before to organize white people for racial justice. And so maybe that's the perfect note to close on is, you know, for all the white folks in this room, may we all deepen our capacities to do that. May we learn how to, to reach out to folks, learn how to call folks in. Um, and I wish you all the best on that journey. It's an important journey. We're all in it together. Um, and I'm deeply grateful to each and every one of you for being here tonight. Once again, if you knew Anne, please stick around. Uh, be in community together to, to talk with, once another, with one another. And the rest of you, I hope to see you some other point in the future. Good night, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Lynn, I'm going to assume that you want to stop the recording. Yes, yes. Thank you, Jacob.